We uh, would also like to make sure that you're aware that comments that are made during this meeting are audio recorded and also video recorded. We're live streaming, so hello everybody sitting on your couch uh, that's watching us tonight. Thanks for joining us. And um, those recordings will form part of the record, which will be retained according to the town's retention bylaw. And if you want more information about that bylaw, you can get it from our clerk. So we have a very, very busy agenda tonight. That's what we get for taking that's uh, for taking a month off. That's what happens. So. Um, we have a procedural bylaw which allows for timing for certain things. Uh, the first thing we're going to be doing is open forum and the open forum uh, is a, a two minute um, uh, timeline and then we're going to be going into uh, presentations and delegations which have a five minute timeline. This is according to our procedural bylaw and the rules governing this house and it's my responsibility as the Mayor, to, um, to hold to that responsibility, so please don't make me be the bad guy. Please don't make me cut you off, because I hate doing it, but if everybody could respect the, uh, the timelines, I have a handy dandy little um, clock up here, and I'll, I'll try to give you a little bit of notice when you're getting close to, to that time. So, having said that, we'll, uh, we'll open with our open forum, and we will uh, start with, we'll do it in the list that uh, people signed up. So the very uh, first item is Angela Michelli, and that's regarding item 6.2, which is the official plan uh, for um, Lakelands. Good evening. Yes, thank you. Hello, good evening. Thank you for receiving uh, this opportunity to be heard. Um, I am here tonight for a couple of reasons, um, mostly prompted by last night's um, presentation about Innisville Beach Park potential changes. And in that, I met some of the residents at Lakelands, and I wanted to just state that I agree with them being opposed to redesignation of the properties along Innisville Beach Road and Lakelands into commercial slash residential. Um, from a position of just a resident and a lover of Lake Simcoe, I have great concerns that this is the direction that the town wishes to take in its official plan because commercialization of natural heritage lands that surround a lake that is already environmentally struggling is the wrong direction to go. And I would hope. So if I could just let people know that when you do that, that's gonna cut into the time. So you know, okay. out of respect, you might want to let uh, Angela say what she wants to say, thank you. So I would hope that the mayor Deputy Mayor and Council, listen very carefully to this delegation and that this delegation be the first of many formal uh, responses from Elconians or Innisfilians um, against some of these commercialization versus naturalization moves that uh, municipalities all around the lake are considering. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is Steve, and I'm going to say this wrong, Steve, uh, regarding 7.3, I can't read the last name, M-O-R-I-J-O-N, did anyone sign up named Steve for open forum? Oh. Okay, yeah, I see you. So there's, okay, so we'll move on to the next one. I think it's A. Pazius. Anyone? We don't, we don't bite, come on. I'm not, I'm not, I didn't mean to be that mean. You can still talk. All right, next. Angela, you had another item? Okay, you're up again. And what's your item? Seven, oh, B1. Thank you. 
Um, yes, I just wish to speak to the ad hoc, uh, Innisfil Beach Park ad hoc committee report, which I have a copy of. And I wanted to speak to uh, the last point in those meeting minutes where uh, you, Mayor Dolan, had inquired about ways of collecting data over the summer regarding walk-ins at the park. And so further to that, um, it states that the committee requests that staff move forward with investigating ideas, calculating data through the summer to determine walk-ins in Isville Beach Park and move forward with an implementation plan. So I just wanted to highlight that as an issue because for the seven years that I've been living here and being um, watching um, people enter the park without paying, walk-ins, swim-ins, boat-ins, whatever you want to call that, and um, the pressure that people parking outside of the parking area um, has put on residents. And I'm, I'm glad to finally see it in writing that you're considering this, but I just want to say it's way too late, especially if you are looking at making plans to further commercialize the beach. This should have been done years ago, and these issues should have been corrected years ago. So I'm hopeful, I'm not sure if I can actually ask the question, but I would like to know what plans have been put in place, if any, to this date, to be able to count walk-ins. Thank you so much. When, if we get to that item and, and perhaps um, somebody might pull it and we might have a discussion at that time. Thank you very much. Thank you. And finally, the other Stephen, Kirschenbrat, re-item B1. Madam Mayor, members of council, my name is Stephen Kirschenblatt. Um, I am a licensed architect of 40 years. I run and founded a, a partnership of, uh, we are architects and planners dealing in the greater GTA area. We're very quite familiar with intensification requirements in the GTA in the greater Ontario, all its growth policies. The idea of how this whole discussion came up about the changes to Innisfil Beach Park are of concern to me. My family has been here, landowners, lakefront property owners for 70 years as well. The changes that happened at Innisfil are huge and I don't really think they were ever intended to be, this place was not intended to be a growth center. I don't know why, Simcoe Region, why Ontario wanted to be a growth center. Barry is a growth center. Barry should intensify, Barry should grow. All of the plans that, the, that Innisfil has to intensify uses at the park are wrong. Some, as, as Angela pointed out, for natural heritage reasons, but just for why. What's the pressure and where is the pressure coming from? Is a private development pressure on, on it? Is there a need for this community, to, for your council to satisfy the new residents that have come into the town? It's great that we've intensified to, as an option for single family home op, uh, uh, ownership in, the, in this community. I think there isn't enough of it, there won't be enough of it closer to the Toronto region and closer to the Toronto. So it's great that we've all allowed that to happen. More intensification does not, is not needed in this municipality. When Barry grows and Barry fills in, when Barry builds out the South Barry GO station and all its high density that it plans to do, let Innisfil con consider for future high density growth or other things. But Friday Harbor is a destination for boaters. It's all there. I supported Friday Harbor all the time. I think it's a great facility. Let it become commercially successful over the years. There's no pressure needed on this plan that somebody created, and I'd like to understand why it, and where it was created, who created this initiative to intensify the end of Innisfil Beach Road. The park needs help, the park could be developed, the park could be used only to serve the community as we see it, not future growth. Thank you, sir. I just will point out that the, um, there was uh, an item on the agenda tonight, B1, which is not about the vision, future vision of the park. The item on the agenda tonight is about 
the park committee that's doing things to fix the park now versus in the future. So um, that is the item. I understand what you're going to, but if you want to speak to the uh, vision of the park, there's opportunity to do that on our web. Well, obviously, if you um, may have been to one of the two open houses, mm -hmm. but also there's opportunity on the website under Make Your Mark on Innisfil Beach Park to make those comments regarding the, that visioning going forward. Okay. Thank you very much Thanks. for your comments. Maybe there should be more awareness of the process that you're going through and yeah. when we all. And when we do, when we come back to this council table and that is on the agenda, you're more than welcome to come back at that time, but that the visioning exercise for Innisfil right. Beach Park is not on tonight's agenda. Really not on tonight's agenda? No. Okay, so the clarity on the website could be there when we should all really spend our time and come to meet you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, we'll do that. Now, I'm gonna ask if there is, uh, again, if the two people uh, that signed up here, item uh, Steve, Morigioi or an A. Pazios, if those two people are here this evening, seeing none, then we will move on. Thank you very much for everybody who participated in open forum. The next item is the approval of the agenda. So the recommendation is on there for the approval of tonight's agenda. There's a, a few items of agenda um, repair or housekeeping that we're going to um, ask for concurrence on. Do you want me to go through each one, Council, or are you confident with the, what's on the screen? The other one, so item 6.2 is just a reordering. Uh, item 5.2, um, again, a reordering. And then it's adding one clause to the staff report, which is D2, which I believe is gonna be pulled anyway. So is everybody okay with that? Can I get a mover and a seconder? Councillor Payne and Councillor Waters, all those in favor? That's carried. Next is uh, disclosure of interest. Does anyone have a conflict of interest on tonight's agenda that they'd like to make note of? Seeing none, if one comes to you during the meeting, please uh, feel free to make it known. Under the new uh, procedural, the new Municipal uh, Act, we are required to do it in writing, but uh, just let us know and the clerk can certainly help us with that. Seeing none, we'll move on. So next is item 5.1, which is a presentation by James Robert McMurty. Mr. McMurtry. Where did everybody go? They signed up on the sheet and then they didn't show. <laughs> so Mr. McMurtry, uh, I believe, uh, had a presentation regarding a petition submission requesting paving of Rosemary Lane, Murray, Pine Rock, Ruth, Richview, and Edith off Big Bay Point Road. So I'll ask one more time. Seeing none, then I guess the motion would be, do we have the petition, Madam Clerk? So then the recommendation then would be that the petition just be received and uh, forwarded to staff. Can I have a mover and a seconder? Deputy Mayor Davidson and seconded by Councillor Ices. And could I ask the clerk's office to reach out to Mr. McMurtry and just let him know that if he wants the opportunity to come back when that staff report is being looked at, he's more than welcome to do that. Thank you. All in, uh, Councillor Payne? I just want to mention, um, your, your Worship, that um, it's very possible that he was in contact with the, one of the staff members as I was speaking with them this morning as well, and that she was going to try to get in touch with him. So maybe that's the case. Thank you. All in favor of the recommendation? Opposed, if any? That's carried. Sorry. The next item is a presentation and petition by Sally Stanley, and that's regarding the Our Place uh, official plan. Whenever you're ready, Ms. Stanley. Thank you. And I'll put five minutes on my clock. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. 
Good evening. Um, our petition regards, as you know, the redesignation of Lakelands Avenue. Lake, okay. This is, hold on. Let me just have a better one. Lakelands Avenue is gentrifying. Real estate values on the street, as you can see from some of these listings, have been climbing significantly for the past number of years. And this is as new homes are replacing old seasonal cottages. People are making significant investments to live on this street. And these new homes are paying the highest residential property taxes for the privilege of living on Lake Simcoe waterfront. So what's the need for redesignation? How is it even justifiable here? And why weren't we told about it? There's absolutely no mention of Lakelands Avenue in the official town plan, Our Place. So why and how did council adopt the OP without telling us about the proposed land use changes for our street? Not a single person on the street knew about the proposed land use changes. Even Councillor Donna Orsati and Mayor Yu, Lynn Dolan, told me that you were unaware of it. Not knowing for us was a big deal because it meant that we lost our chance to formally voice objections during the OP process. Now that we know, do you know that 96% of area residents oppose these changes? And these are the same taxpayers that are paying dearly for the privilege of living on and by the lake. Since we still live in a democracy, it would seem that something went very wrong here, and we're asking council to change it. Because if we don't, really, democracy won't last. The provincial policy standards and statements are very clear about land use and redevelopment. So designating expensive residential waterfront for commercial is simply not efficient development. Redevelopment should be occurring in appropriate locations, underused lots and brownfield sites, not high value waterfront homes on a street that's already booming with upscale residential development. So what's the real reason? for land use changes on Lakelands because it doesn't make sense to any of us. Changing land use for any portion of Lakelands Avenue will affect the entire area and the entire street. Again, provincial policy calls for orderly progression of development within designated growth areas. Is it orderly to disrupt a street that's already gentrifying? It's not easy for us living next to Innisfil Beach Park. Residents cope with the following myriad of problems that you see there due to the influx of non-residents during the summer months, and these are just some of them. The proposed Innisfil Beach Park Master Plan only intensifies these problems for us. And sound moves faster over water, and it amplifies. In fact, speed of sound and amplification is 4.35 times that on land. So in our homes on the waterfront, it's four and a half times louder for noise. So entertainment and cultural events and beer gardens and the kinds of things being proposed for the beach park plan simply equal noise pollution for us. And it's going to change the quality of our lives. People live here for peace and tranquility, not for placemaking. Residents have other concerns with the master plan for Innisfil Beach Park. Hundreds of boats, yet another marina when we already have Friday Harbor and Lafroy close by. Canals cutting into the park, floating docks, beach expansions to accommodate even more people in a small area, commercial businesses, restaurants, and stores. For us, the master plan brings to mind Joni Mitchell's prophetic song, Big Yellow Taxi, they paved paradise and they put up a parking lot. Don't it always seem to, to go that you don't know what you've got till it's gone? And what will happen if the quality of the water, to the quality of our water once this lake gets urbanized? How long is it going to take to undo the benefits of the Lake Simcoe Conservation Act, especially if intensification ravages our, our lakefront areas? Have you considered the effect of noise on aquatic life? Because scientists have, and international standards are now being set for sound due to their impact on aquatic life. 
In the August 1st issue of the Innisfil Journal, Brian Jin, limnologist for the Lake Simcoe Conservation Authority, warns us in a very timely way, now is not the time to take our eyes off the lake. He explains that this is because the biology of Lake Simcoe is still threatened despite cleanup efforts by the province. Hundreds of boats in a small park and placemaking to bring even more people to this small area can't be good for Lake Simcoe. So I'm asking you all, Council, please don't destroy this amazing street from this and this to this because it would be a crime sh crying shame, not just for us, but for future generations in, in our area. We're asking you now to amend the official plan our place with, an, with a housekeeping amendment, return Lakelands Avenue to its original designation and keep placemaking away from the shores of Lake Simcoe and Innisfil Beach Park. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stanley. I think if you wanted to stay at, sorry, if you want to stay at, there might be questions. Uh, this is a delegation, so we're happy to take, uh, to ask questions and, or ask, have council ask you questions you. if they wish. So council, any questions or comments for Ms. Stanley? Deputy Mayor Davidson. Thank you, first of all, I'd like to thank you for your presentation, it was excellent. Uh, I agree with you, we have a harbors, other places, marinas that we can focus on and they being private enterprise, they should have the marinas and make the profit. I don't think it's a municipality, we're in the business of running municipalities. I don't believe also that we're in the business of building more buildings to provide commercial space for private business in the park. I, am a, I, I think people around here that know me know that I believe a park should have trees and walking paths, not commercial outlets. And Friday Harbor happens to have a lot of commercial outlets that they can't even rent out. And I could go on to expand on that, but I won't at this time. So I like your presentation. I think we should take it under consideration, Council. I think a lot of us, when the decision was made, weren't aware of the full details. So I will be open about that. And I think this council would appreciate maybe the opportunity of looking back at it. I can't speak for them, but I understand your concerns and I'll work with you on that, okay? Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, council. I'm just, I'm going to um, try to divide this uh, topic because the, the petition and the presentation tonight is regarding the official plan and the designation on Lakelands. The, uh, park and the vision of the park is still an open consultation. It would be unfair of us to, to debate and talk and make decisions about a park plan when we're still asking people to send in their comments. So for us to predispose you know, what we think should happen while we're still out in the entire community, asking the entire community what they think, what what the vision of, a, of the park should be. So the, my understanding is that Ms. Stanley came here tonight with, with, um, to talk about the official plan and how it affects the sections of the official plan that was passed in 2017 and how it affects uh, Lakelands and, and her, her um, property in particular. So if we could, uh, there'll be time, again, like I said to the other gentlemen, there'll be lots of time to talk about the vision, but it's unfair to the other 30,000 residents in Innisfil that all have a stake in this park because it's not on the agenda tonight. Okay, then I think it is, uh, we are deserving to know why the redes redesignation yes. is happening. Exactly, and we're, we're, we're here to talk about the redesignation and the official plan that was passed and, and, um, and your concerns about that. And then we're also happy to talk about a vision for the park, um, again, when that item comes to council, if, if, that's, um, if that makes sense to everybody, because if we're in the middle of consultation, it's really difficult for us to uh, to make an opinion and tell people what we think and then say to them, oh yeah, but you still have time to come to us and tell us what you think, but we've already made up our minds. So are you telling me then that, or telling us that the redesignation has nothing to do with the beach park plan? The, re the redesignation 
was part of the, uh, the official plan that was done, Mr. Kane will help me, we start in 20, 2015, it was in this year. 2015 and passed by council, the former council in 2017. And, and the, the park visioning plan then is the next step. So I, I should let Mr. Kane talk about the process of planning. So you first you do this big kind of 30,000 foot kind of visioning exercise with the, with the, that encompasses the entire town of Ennisville. And then from that vision, then you, uh, so the reason that we're talking about the Innisfil Beach Park vision now is, is in light or in lieu of, of what people told us during the official plan um, visioning exercise. Mr. Kane, can you fill in the blanks there? And then I'll open it to council. Sure, Your Worship. So, yeah, as you are aware, the, the Innisfil official plan, our place is that 20 year vision for the municipality. So. Uh, in that plan, um, you know, it was presented to council um, a variety of options for the future vision of the town, uh, including, uh, including this section of uh, Innisfil Beach Road uh, and Lake Lands, although not specifically described. So, you know, in the mapping of that exercise and in the background documents um, and in the consultation that we heard to date about placemaking initiatives, um, it became, you know, that area was an area of interest, you know, during that consultation process. Um, as a result, um, and as you mentioned, you know, um, the demand by all residents in the town for that particular area of Innisfil was very high, uh, and the decision was made to uh, initiate, you know, those first steps in terms of connecting Main Street, Innisfil Beach Road to the lake, uh, and that was through the redesignation uh, of those properties along Innisfil Beach Road uh, and a handful of properties on Lakelands Avenue to, to maintain that connection through. Um, you're right, the next step now with the Innisfil Beach Park Master Plan is starting to, is starting to realize that vision um, through a master planning exercise to um, take it to the next step in terms of, you know, we've heard that this was, um, this is a desirable vision for uh, the next 20 years. Uh, how do we get there? And a key part of that is what the future for Innisfil Beach Park is. Thank you. Uh, questions uh, from Ms. Stanley? Uh, Deputy Mayor. Just to follow up to my comments, I understand your, your concerns there, uh, Mayor. Um, when we were looking at this decision to make that one strip from the, on the Innisfil Beach Road from the 25th to the park entrance, at that time we, or I, understood that that was gonna become a commercial sector. We did not know at the time that it impacted the waterfront property like lands directly. So that's something new to, our, I think myself, I can't speak for all of council. But at the same time that we were given that information, the Innisfil Beach Park process was presented to us that this was to tie in with future enhancements over the next 20 years with Innisfil Beach Park. That was the reason we made the decision. So I agree with separating the two. We're not dealing with the master plan of the park. However, when we were given this information, it was tying in with the master plan. So that's why I combined the two together. So I'm prepared to say we won't deal with the other tonight, but we were under the decision that night that we did not know about the waterfront being put into the same category and we were working with the master plan for the park for the future. Thank you. May I comment on that too and add to it? Because in our case, we felt exactly the same way. We were aware of Innisfil Beach Road, but none of us were aware that Lakelands was being absorbed because we're not Innisfil Beach Road. We have a different street name. Legally, we are a different place. And um, it, it therefore blindsided us and took away certain rights we had for objection, which we feel as a group very, very upset about. Um, the other thing is when we received the notice of interim control by law being passed, 05919, that was the point where we learned about it. And, and I had to call Ms. Osati because I thought this couldn't be true. How could this be? How could we not know? And she, at that time, told me she wasn't aware of it either. So, and other council members I spoke to yesterday also told me they didn't know. So, so if we didn't know, then the official planning process was warped. 
it, something went terribly wrong there because we have a right to know something that important. I mean, we get parking notices, uh, notices of changes on the most minor levels at times in our mailboxes. Why wouldn't this have been done? And I truly, even reading the, the interim control bylaw notice, um, because my property was affected, I couldn't believe that it was, and I thought I was reading something wrong, and it was only on this map designation with a circle marked where my property actually is, it was so unclear. And, and in that statement, it referred to the fact that our properties were frozen because there were decisions being made about the park. So that it's natural for us to tie these two things together, and I just wanted to explain that. Thank you. Thank you, and I totally understand that. Um, I just want to talk a little bit, though, I, I, uh, about the, the process and official plan process. And you're absolutely right. Uh, the official plan process covers all of Venniceville, all 16,000 homes. So could I tell you exactly which home on which street was affected by the official plan? I cannot. But I can tell you there's a lot more than simply Lakelands. Um, there's streets all over the municipality who are impacted when we do an official plan one way or the other. We try so hard. Like the Planning Act is very prescriptive and the Planning Act requires that we do A, B, C, and D. And we did, and we did H, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O as well. We, we went to hockey games and set up pop-ups. We, we, we would entice people with, we're gonna have a draw for a prize if you comment on the official plan. We try so hard to get residents interested in being part of that vision and being part of the official plan process. It's really important to us. I get it, it's dry material and you think, well, if it doesn't affect me, then you know maybe I'm not going to pay attention to it. But then on the other hand, I mean, we're, we're willing to learn and we've certainly learned that what you're telling us is that we should be putting all of the street names in Innisfil that are identified in official plan for some kind of a change. But even then, you've got a document that's got 300 street names. Are you going to look through it and find yours? If we're affected with potential rezoning, I yeah. think yes. So, yeah. So, at this point, I can tell you that we did send out emails, and, and, they, and they started, they said, uh, you know, notice of public open house, blah, 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 blah. Uh, come learn about the town's official plan. Ask questions, provide comments. This will affect you. And, and there was at least a dozen emails. So I'm, I'm not, I guess I am a being a little defensive of staff because I, I, I do, you know, I do think that we have a very good planning staff, so I'm being a little bit defensive. But I'm not suggesting we don't need to learn. I'm getting that too, right? So please don't take it as me saying we did everything right. Um, that we can always do more. We do do way more than we're required under the Planning Act. We ticked, the, we could have ticked the three boxes and said we did everything the Planning Act requires of us, tough beans. But we're not saying that. We're saying we want to work to make sure that we learn from this because we're going to do official plans every five years. So, you know, we've been through a number of them and, and we'll, we'll, every time we do one, we'll do a little bit better. Then why is it that, I'm just asking the planning department or the clerk's office, why is it that we get notices of the passing of an interim control bylaw? Mr. Kane? So the, the, notice, the, intern, the notice of the passing interim control bylaw was, you know, part of that implementation process. So, you know, once that direction of the new official plan was set by council, uh, then, you know, it becomes the task of staff to start implementing that direction. So, you know, one of the first pieces of implementing that direction was, you know, taking a temporary freeze on development in certain areas of the town, in this case, Lakelands and Innisfil Beach Road, uh, to allow that detail to be developed in consultation with the public um, through processes like the Minnesota, Innisfil Beach Park Master Plan and, and the future rezoning process, you know, to get that input for that next refinement of the, um, of the implementation side. So the interim control bylaw, you know, was, you know, preventing, you know, um, 
preventing more concern, I guess, from residents, you know, and preventing further investments from residents just until we knew what the rules were going to be and what that was look like. Um, so the interim control bylaw, you know, doesn't change anything. All it does is just hits the pause button. It doesn't change anything along that section of, um, along those properties along there. You know, what it does do is it, you know, it, it engages that community and it's been demonstrated that it's done that quite well um, and allows for that further discussion through things like the master plan and to the rezoning that will come before council and come before the public for comment. Thank you. Um, Mr. Rayner and then Councillor Waters. Thank you, Worship. <clears throat> Through you to uh, members of council. Uh, I just wanted to point out that um, when I met with uh, the proponent earlier, uh, a couple of weeks ago now, I guess, uh, when we sat down uh, and discuss this issue, I understood they would be coming forward with a delegation to discuss actually the vision uh, for Innisfil Beach Park. It appears they've taken a different tack to talk to you about the official plan. Uh, I think council should know that they've retained a lawyer and are participating in an LPAT a hearing specifically about this issue. So uh, I'm not sure how much more productive we can be in public session. Perhaps the best uh, advice I can provide is to direct the delegate to us uh, to discuss uh, this issue because they there is a legal process that they have now chosen to partake in and and I think they've chosen their path to be frank uh, that's not to say there isn't settlement opportunities but this isn't the forum to discuss settlement opportunities uh, related to the official plan to the extent that there's visioning discussion about Innisfil Beach Park which we know is coming I think that's definitely the time for the public discussion thank you worship Councillor Waters uh, considering what the CEO just said, um, and I'm being a new councillor, I'm not sure uh, what we're allowed to talk about when we have discussions in special council, whether or not those discussions can be discussed out here or not. So I don't want to say anything without asking that for clarification. So I don't want to, I don't want to say something and, and that was discussed in council or we just do that later on, just to clarify some of the comments been, that have been talked about uh, with the deputy mayor. Yes. Session? No, then, then no. Okay. Other, other questions or comments? Councillor Rossetti? <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you for a wonderful presentation, Sally. It was very, uh, very good and, and very thoughtful and certainly thought provoking. Um, I think one of the, the clarifications and one thing that we've learned um, when the uh, I don't, I'm trying to figure the proper wording of this, uh, just with that interim control bylaw. So when the diagram came to us, it's a straight line. And I think moving forward, and even staff will probably, you know, if ever it's used again, or in any um, descriptions, make sure that they include every house and see where the line goes. Because we assumed, I assumed incorrectly, straight down, ending at Lakelands, not including the water. So it certainly, as I've expressed to you, has my support in uh, for those Lakeland residents on the waterfront um, in that. But I don't want to go into discussions uh, here because this I'm being guided otherwise. I did uh, promise to have a meeting uh, with, your, with the residents along Lakelands, along Inneso Beach Road, and um, I wanted to take as a recommendation uh, the residents on the back of Hastings uh, to a meeting uh, with um, uh, our CAO, our mayor, and uh, Mr. Kane from our planning to understand, um, not debate, the interim control bylaw, but to clearly understand um, the process and how it's used and why it was used here. And then also uh, an opportunity for residents if they wanted to have the forms to complete information on the proposed uh, changes to Innisil Beach Park, which as the mayor said is completely different. But it does have a consequence because what happens to the park impacts all the residents along Innisil Beach Road and along Lakelands. And I know that from being the ward councillor, and that's why I fought before in the last term to get those changes for the parking restrictions to make it better for the residents along there. So uh, we are um, going to uh, work on a date, and we, have, um, we are looking at about the 
first week in September, if you think that's uh, an acceptable time. And I'll get back to you um, after this uh, when we can confirm the location and day and time. And notices will be sent to all the residents. Can I get back to you with dates? Because we will be away from September 6th through the 25th. OK. Uh, all right. Thank you. My husband and I will. But I just want to mention that I'm representing our street here. This is not about me. Yes, Michael and I have chosen to take a different tack because we feel the appropriateness uh, and provincial policy is in conflict. And uh, so that is a separate issue. And I'm presenting a petition here, and this is the grounds for it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to take the, because I can, the, the, the moment to make the last statement. Um, official plan designation. Um, as many of you probably know, I live in Cookstown uh, in, um, with beautiful, huge, million dollar, gorgeous um, homes that are, some of them her very heritage, 150 years and more. Many of them have been designated core commercial for over 100 years or whenever they're the Planning Act was invented. So, and they're still homes, and people grow up in those homes and they sell them to young families, and those young families grow up in those homes and, and they're still core commercial. So it's, it's designation itself is not the same as, 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 a, as a rezone. So for anyone who, uh, I just wanted to leave that with you. Thank you. And thank you very much for your presentation. And the recommendation is in front of us, which is that the uh, petition be received regarding the objections to the redesignation and of our and the uh, town's official plan, and it be received as information and forwarded to staff. Can I have a mover and a seconder for that, Councillor Orsatti and Councillor Ices? All those in favor? That is carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next presentation is from our deputy clerk, Patty Toma, and she's going to talk to us uh, about procedural bylaw updates. Whenever you're ready. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for coming out on this gorgeous evening. Uh, when council was uh, brought into office uh, last fall, uh, one of the first things that clerk services did was provided an overview of the procedural bylaw which was passed initially by the last term of council in January of 2018. So you've had a few months now to work with it, try it out, see what's working, what's not working. And clerk services has been um, uh, reviewing it as well and observing uh, what's working, what's not working and have come up with a few ideas to present to council, which we will be doing in October. Uh, we would also like to get council's input uh, and any ideas that they may have to offer. Some of the proposed changes will be some minor housekeeping to clarify, tidy up. Currently, the bylaw has information um, that changed the, the meeting dates from the first and the third Wednesday to the second and the fourth. So that information should be removed at this time because it is no longer needed. Uh, meeting start times, we wanna look at uh, providing a cons consistent start time for public planning meetings. Uh, that we, uh, if there's a public planning meeting, then everybody knows there's a, a certain time they'll start. Uh, notice requirements, we want to look at, currently the bylaw offers uh, emergency circumstances, but we want to look at that where sometimes it's not necessarily an emergency, which is also covered in another clause, but there could be critical circumstances requiring counselors weighing in on something for consideration. We're also looking at um, uh, talking to council about having an alternate chair for committee of the whole or closed session, which offers a learning opportunity for other members of council who may wish to move up at some point to try the deputy mayor's uh, position or become mayor at a future date. And we're looking at consent agenda, transparency and efficiencies, ways that the public can find information more readily and also how we can move through an agenda when it's heavy in a, uh, at a better pace. Um, other items that we're looking at is how, I, how motions are moved, who can move them, and also how uh, recorded votes can be taken, and also asking council their opinion on whether or not they'd like to include a land acknowledgement within the bylaw for special occasions or regular occasions. So at this time, I'd like council to start thinking about areas they'd like to see improvement, 
uh, getting some comment and advising that we'll be preparing a draft for the first cycle in October, which will be October the 9th, with a final draft coming to Council for consideration on October the 23rd. So in the upcoming weeks, I'm asking if members of Council could take some time and either email me or drop in or set up a meeting time to talk about the bylaw or if there's areas where you'd like uh, clarification. And then I will be meeting with uh, Clerk Services. We'll be present, providing a report and a draft to Council in October and Council may uh, amend, change, or go with that draft, which we're hoping to pass um, have final approval on October 23rd. So at this time, I'm just letting you know that this is something we're doing and providing lots of time so that you can think about it, uh, get some positive uh, input, and bring that back to you for your consideration uh, in the next few weeks. And if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them at this time. Thank you so much, Deputy Clerk Toma. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you for that. Uh, this, is, this was one of the things on our to-do list. If you recall, when we first took office, we, uh, I said, let's ride the bike a little while and then see how we felt about it, whether we needed to grease the wheels or fix the steering wheel or see how we, uh, how we felt about it. I I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, was excited to, uh, to look at the opportunity, I believe it was former Mayor Bagley that first started the opportunity of sharing the chair to, uh, uh, in committee. And, uh, and I thought that was a great opportunity for, um, for, for people to try their, their hand at the chair and just you know gain another skill. Um, having said that, if there's somebody who really is not interested in doing it, that's okay too. It's not we're going to make you do it, but we want to make it open to everybody to be able to have that opportunity, particularly in committee, and uh, I look forward, to, look forward to seeing that draft. So thank you. Any other comments or questions? Councillor Rossetti. Uh, just a, a, a recommendation that uh, maybe the list that uh, Ms. Toma has uh, put on the uh, screen could be sent to councillors as a tickle idea to start spurring the uh, feedback that you are looking for. Thank you. So a mover and a seconder to receive. Councillor uh, Van Berkel and Councillor Waters, all those in favour? That's carried. Next is a delegation from Jen Ray, our communications fundraising coordinator, and I'll let her introduce her special guests. Good evening, Mayor Dolan, Deputy Mayor Davidson, Council, and my fellow town staff members. On behalf of the Innisfil Community Foundation's Board of Directors, I'd like to thank you for hearing us tonight. Um, so that you can learn a bit about how the Foundation Board wishes to make our community stronger. Uh, before you hear from the Board, I'd like to just briefly share a background on how the Community Foundation uh, has developed. Uh, we're very fortunate here in Innisfil to have the generosity of the Ontario Lottery and Gaming Corporation. Since 2002, the OLG has provided the town with funds to support community projects. We're also fortunate for the foresight of the 2010 to 2014 council who thought, asked us to start thinking about how those funds could be used to make a bigger impact in the community. It was that council who in 2013 committed to transferring an annual amount of $100,000 per year of OLG money into a reserve fund for a future Innisfil Community Foundation. The plan was to reach $1 million threshold before launching the foundation. In 2018, knowing that the fund was getting close to that $1 million amount, the 2014 to 2018 Council directed staff to put the legal structure of the foundation into place. That decision allowed us to bring on three incredible community leaders as the foundation's first board of directors. That's Ann Kell, Howard Courtney, and Sandra Rosardo. Today, the reserve fund sits at just over $1 million. There's a strong leadership team in place with a vision of tackling some of the deep-rooted systemic problems that are facing Innisfil. The Innisfil Community Foundation has been in development for six years and three terms of council. We hope that the 2018 to 2022 council will help us put the final pieces in motion so that we can officially launch the Innisfil Community Foundation into, in 2020. 
I would like to invite the board to share their vision of how the Innisfil Community Foundation will help the community and invite Ann Kelp to start. Thank you, Jen. Good evening, everyone. So Innisfil really is a special place. I think the sense of community here is unlike anywhere else. Every day our neighbors are pulling up their sleeves and working together to make our town a better place for all of us. There are so many organizations in Innisfil that are doing amazing work here already. So the purpose of the foundation is not to duplicate that good work that's already being done, but to accelerate it. The foundation will work alongside charities, nonprofits, and community groups because we know that together we can do so much more. We'll work together to come up with creative solutions for some of the major systemic issues that are causing our friends and our neighbors to hurt. And to frame the foundation's mission, we're going to think globally while acting locally. So to do that, we're gonna look at the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals for solutions that will work right here in Innisfil. These established global goals will give the foundation structure and will help us to validate the areas that we're going to focus on. We have a unique opportunity to experiment and develop solutions in our own backyard. And it's our hope that our work in Innisfil will have a ripple effect that's going to be felt by communities beyond our borders. Okay, thank you. I'd like to introduce Howard Courtney. Being part of the foundation, we have had a good chance to chat about where we're going and what we're doing. Uh, but as a community, we really don't think we have a poverty problem, but uh, in fact, we have a chronic poverty and hunger problem here in Innisfil. If you look at the Stats Canada, uh, some of the images we have like on the screen, we don't really picture that as a hunger problem, but it's much deeper, but that's part of it. There's always people that are struggling. There are more people living in poverty in Innisfil than we think. Many more who've, with just one life change, will make a huge impact on them. An illness, a job change, a divorce, any of these could set into motion a series of events that would leave people unable to make ends meet. Many of our neighbors who are living in poverty are hardworking, but they have low-wage jobs. Their housing might be insecure. They're consumed by worry or uncertainty, wondering if everything's gonna continue and they're gonna be able to make ends meet. But sadly, the growing number of people in poverty are also seniors. We have a major seniors population in town as well, and we know that the old age uh, pensions aren't just enough to cover their basic needs anymore, that many of those seniors are suffering. Uh, they might have to pay, uh, decide between paying their rent or paying their heat or sitting at home not able to go out because they haven't got the funds to do it, facing depression, not having places to go or the money to go there. Alongside of that is not only the poverty, but food insecurity. And these two items often go hand in hand. Simply put, food insecurity is simply meaning that we don't have enough money to buy food. It's choosing what you're gonna pay next, whether you're gonna pay your electrical bill or get food. And then there's those cases we don't really want to think about, the rumbling feeling in a mother's tummy when she goes to bed hungry because she wanted the kids to eat. We don't always see those particular things in public, but these are the kinds of things we face in our community. And I think of a single mom who accesses our food bank, lives on minimum wage income, she has a special needs child, her rental costs are high in relation to her income, she's behind in her utilities, she's facing eviction, and there's no affordable, in, affordable housing for her. 
Or we think of another middle-aged lady who uses our food bank, who works at a local business, but again, it's low wages. Her father's currently dying. She's left an abusive relationship. She's had an addiction problem in the past, but she's recovering from that and seems to be doing okay. But with one simple life change, everything could fall apart. We think the foundation will be able to help us support existing groups that are already helping, but also the implementation of new programs that are going to help serve long term in our town to make this a stronger and a better place. I think there's some great things ahead should the council continue the process of what they started to approve this foundation. And finally, Sandra Rosardo. Stories like these are why we believe so deeply in the Innisfil Community Foundation potential. The foundation will shine a light on some of our community's bigger social issues. By working hand in hand with organizations that already have such a deep understanding of our community issues, we hope to help solve some of those rooted causes of our local hardships. We do this by awarding bigger grants with multi-year funding that allow nonprofits to grow and be adaptive to the changing needs of our community. And we do this by authenticating, partnering with other agencies and rallying in our networks behind them. By making these large-scale investments and treating grantees as true partners in the Innisfil Community Foundation will elevate causes, build resources, and drive improvements that will make a direct impact on all lives of our friends and neighbors. There's so much good in Innisfil. Just imagine how much more we can achieve if we all work together with a purpose. That's our foundation. Thank you very much. Thank you all of you for being here today and thank you for that wonderful presentation. We're going to um, be dealing with this uh, in, later on, I think it's 9.2 in our, in our package, but uh, take this opportunity now. Um, you're all such busy people. I, where do you find the time to do this work on top of everything else that you do? Uh, thank you all for agreeing to, uh, to be part of this. Questions or comments from members of council? Uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you. I appreciate the work that you guys do, and I know there's a few of you I've known for years that I trust you 100% with your uh, endeavors with this community fund and the community as a, as a whole. And I think when we get to 9.2, I've had some time over the weekend to study this, and I may have some solutions to even enhance it and make it better for you, so we'll talk then, okay? Thank you. Anyone else? Councillor Sadi? Um, just clarification, I, and I don't know whether it's at this time in the um, delegation or later when we uh, bring it on the agenda uh, for discussions about clarification and how this fund is going to work in the community and whether this is, uh, you know, how does this, does this eliminate organizations and groups that previously would come to the town for, um, you know, inspiring Innisfil uh, funds. So, you know, that's one of the concerns that I have. And I want to know how that fits in here. Thank you. So I think if the questions are for uh, Ms. Ray or the committee uh, or the foundation members, board members, it would be a good time to ask now. If, if you're thinking about asking, you know, the treasurer or the CAO, then probably better in 9.2, if that works. Is Council concurs with that. Councillor Fowler. Just one question in regards to the actual structure. I've, I've, been, I've read over the report, but I don't see uh, any mention of the people in the town uh, being a part of this. We, we mentioned the executive board. We've mentioned the people that are going to be in what positions, but how many seats are going to be there? How many are they going to be able to apply? Are, is there going to be any council involvement? Because it's a separate entity from the town itself. How is this going to play out 
in the long run because I'm, I'm seeing only part of the picture here and I want to see the full picture so that everybody who has questions can say, oh, wait a minute, I can be a part of that and I can help promote this or guide its future as opposed to, well, we've just taken something that the committees have and given it to them and they're just making decisions as they see fit. If you look in the report, uh, one of the quotes is, um, the executive director will work with the board of directors to help the following strategies and policies to ensure fiscal responsibility and sustainable growth. Grant making policies and procedures to defy when, how, to whom, and for what purpose the foundation will award grants. So we need to see how much input the actual residents have or even someone myself, for example, one of us volunteers for this um, from council to speak for the people. So I'm gonna start by saying that ever since we first started, when we first started getting, we're fortunate enough to get money from the Ontario Lottery and Gaming Corporation, and I think it was under former councillor, or Mayor Jackson, that decided to put this community fund out. We made it clear right from the start that this was an arm's length committee. We certainly didn't want uh, the perception that council was using this fund, you know, for their pet projects, that sort of thing. So it has always been, right from the beginning, um, an arm's length process, but now more formally a charitable, it's a charitable not-for-profit organization that's been formed, but I'll let, uh, I'll let Reverend Courtney speak to that. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I think you've, uh, um, Madam Mayor, rather, I think you've answered the question well. The, the, the concept was that this foundation will operate and function entirely separate from the town in terms of a designation of funds, the approval of funds, and that puts the council at arm's length so that there's no appearance of conflict of interest in terms of funding that comes into that fund uh, through developers or whatever else source comes in. It would be totally separated from the, the leadership of the council and the town itself. Uh, but the foundation ultimately does depend on the town giving the support and making sure that, the, that there's funds there to use for the foundation's purposes. Uh, and, and I think that the, the board itself, the number of members on the board will continue to expand depending on as we go forward. Uh, we will want to engage individuals with specific expertise as we go forward as the fund grows and as the uh, requests come in for that fund. Councillor, Councillor Rayner. Mr. Rayner. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I just, uh, Council does have the uh, authority under your procedural bylaw to move uh, uh, agenda items around, uh, certainly out of respect for your foundation board members. If you wanted to move forward, uh, DSR, I can't remember the number, uh, 9.2 uh, forward to now. To I think you're seeing that the foundation board members actually have probably a number of the answers that you're looking for, and out of the respect for their time, if it's possible, you could move it forward, but it's entirely up to you, Council. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Then do we have to resolve into committee the whole, or can we bring that, we can bring that forward in Council? Okay, all right, then we'll do that. So um, with Council's concurrence, that is, we'll bring item 9.2 forward to discuss now. So 9.2, um, for those of you following at home, or those of you who grabbed an agenda off the back table, is staff report DSR-120-19. And uh, the recommendation is, um, I think, what, did you want us to move and second the presentation and receive? Okay, so a mover and a seconder to receive the presentation, item 6.1, Councillor Van Burkle and Councillor Waters, all in favor? That's carried, okay? And now we'll go to item D2, the recommendation that, uh, that is before you on the screen, and uh, Councillor Fowler. I just had a follow-up with regard to Pastor Courtney's comments. Um, I understand how you said separating council from, from this particular body is, is the benefit of all, but my question as well is um, if residents wish to be involved, like everyday residents, if they come to wish, can they volunteer their positions? Can they speak for themselves at this particular board? Are they allowed to do so or as members or is it only specific members that have to apply for it? The intention of, of the foundation at this point, and again, we're in formative stages, 
but we've had considerable discussion on this as well, that we want to, to uh, go to the community and find out what the community feels that they need and what are, what's available and who is out there. We want to support existing uh, charities that are out there. There are certainly clear, clear legislative boundaries that we do need to support ch charities, approved charities. Uh, we want charities that are already existent, possibly to partner with us to create other programs that are in need in the community. And uh, we will certainly be looking to others to have input uh, in, into the programs and, and the door is going to be open uh, for their input for sure. Thank you. Could I ask um, to, if you could um, highlight a little bit about where this money originally, like the, besides the Ontario Lottery and Gaming Corporation, the, the, the amount, the small amount of money actually per year that comes from that fund, but also from the Mayor's Golf Tournament, the Spirit of the Community, other fundraising. I guess what I'm trying to highlight is these aren't tax dollars, that these are, this is money raised uh, through the through the community and hopefully being um, being having a charitable receipt uh, being able to raise more money that way as well and yes yeah, so that's part of what um, what the plan is is to use the ology funds use the um, the the donations that come through fundraising events for this but there's also a bigger plan to um, grow our assets, to grow the foundation's assets through um, fundraising, which would be planned giving. And uh, there's, as, as baby boomers are aging, there's a lot of wealth being transferred through the generations. So there's a lot of opportunity for the foundation to grow through um, through the dollars in that are in the community. And what better way to have those dollars go to the community to support um, the groups that need them rather than going to the Canada Revenue Agency. Questions or comments? Councillor Sadi. Thank you. Um, I have several. So um, I, I, I appreciate the board. I, I think that, you know, we couldn't have better representatives in the community that are so well versed in and in, in experience um, uh, with a lot of uh, a pulse of what's happening in the community. But I just want a, a better understanding of this. And um, when council before, and you're saying even uh, mayor back to uh, uh, previous mayors, uh, in the last council, we agreed to um, have the, the funds set aside. We were going into an election year. There was no uh, spirit of the community um, fundraiser. There was the mayor's golf tournament. That money, we agreed to go to the Rosardo Health Center. So I guess I'm just, I'm a little concerned from a councillor from what's happened in the past. Um, so if you'll just help me, I'll, I'll shoot a, a bunch of questions and then you can choose which ones to answer. One, um, it seems now that we are creating a department in the town of Innisfil that is going to be going out and fundraising, I'm not sure with developers, or is this just going to be the money from the OLG, the spirit of the community, and the mayor's golf tournament? Um, um, the, I, I don't know that it's a, a department within the town of Innisfil that's doing this. The, the employee that would be supporting the board of directors would be working with the board of directors to, to do that under the foundation uh, umbrella, not the town of Innisfil umbrella. Um, so I don't, I don't know that. Did, did we not have volunteers before? Because now we're looking at $50,000, half of a full-time FTE, $50,000. Um, I thought before we, it was $15,000. It's a big difference um, to administer this. Our, our long-term goal on the foundation would be to have a full-time executive director managing all of this because we perceive that this is not going to be small in nature. We need to grow, we need to make a significant difference, and we need somebody that's in place that's going to help agencies uh, develop the programs and complete the applications and do the process. One of the things that I identified very early is that we, I have never applied for a grant in this municipality because 
I don't have time to do that. To do that. I'd rather just do the program. So in our, in our discussion, we would like somebody on a staff basis to help organizations formulate the plans and put those in place and administer that. We're, we're looking at this point of a 50-50 opportunity that the town would pay 50% in terms of their communication officer, but that would also, 50% would also come out of our funding for that position at this time. But the long-term goal is that that would not be a, a burden on the municipality at all, that that would be part of our funding program and managing it. We think there's a lot of dollars available and it's going to be transferred to the next generation really soon. And if we can get into that quickly with having a full-time executive director, that will help us accomplish that. It will take us time to get there though. And so this is a bridging opportunity for the town to help us make sure we get started strong and we're able to continue strong. Thank you for the opportunity for follow-up. So um, just clarification then in uh, going out and finding out the charities that are needed uh, that you would be supporting through this foundation, would that, so that could be homelessness, food, uh, health, is, is that the type that you're looking at when you're saying you're looking at charities? So we want to work with the charities and the community organizations and the nonprofits that are already up and running in Innisfil that are already doing different pieces of that. A lot of those goals are all interconnected and Howard, Howard talked a little bit about that in his part of the presentation. So our thought is that we will have a, a community round table, if you like, to talk with all of those groups as a starting point find out what's being covered, maybe what's being duplicated, maybe what's being missed, and work together to try to figure out a strategy. Um, and that'll be a work in progress. We'll go from there, but that's the initial step. One final question then, back to the, um, we have so many organizations from the Rotary, from Innisfil Events Corporation, from groups that have tried to, uh, they put on events and different things in the town that benefit the community as a whole. And I'm afraid that these, these groups, I'm not sure if they're included or, or eliminated through this or they're handled no longer. So I just want some direction on there because they're the ones that built this community. And those are the ones that we would see in sometimes the, um, the council discretionary fund as to whether to help them with a fee or a permit or waiving. I'm just thinking that's all being eliminated and uh, can you help me out with that? The um, council discretionary fund we're still looking into. Um, we're looking into ways of building that into the operating budget. So we know that that's a very important piece um, for the community and for council. So we're investigating ways of um, of looking at that in the future and we'll report back to you. Um, as far as funds for other community groups, um, there is still $50,000 that we're suggesting um, remain as an inspiring Innisfil grants program within the foundation. The foundation would administer it, um, but it would go to support the groups that we know are already utilizing those resources and that depend on those resources. Um, right now, it is $50,000 that has been allocated from the OLG funds every year for that group, but the reason you're seeing um, bigger amounts going out through Innisfil, inspiring Innisfil uh, funds, or th sorry, through the grant program is because of the funds that were donated and raised at the events. Um, but that core $50,000 that was originally attached to uh, inspiring Innisfil grants will remain. Deputy Mayor. However, I understand the direction you're going with poverty and I understand how it's growing. Using the UN for me is not exactly a friend of mine. I look at Rwanda, how they turned their back on hundreds of thousands of people that were slaughtered. So the UN to me is not an example that we should be using. However, on that point, um, I understand that we have to keep the key principle of the community 
uh, I've done some homework on the weekend, so I'll read what I've written and put together. We have to keep the key principle the community foundation is given, and we want to make sure that it doesn't tank over the years, that we don't lose all that money that was given to us, and some of that money going back to grant program review, February 15th, 2012, DSR 03012. A community foundation is registered charity which seeks and pools gifts and endowments to sustain itself. Income generated from gifts and endowments are used to support local charity causes. Endowments are money that was given to us by whether it be developers, businesses, or whatever that we cannot touch. In other words, that's your principle. So we've got to make sure that this foundation uses its interest or money made to reinvest back into the community. Secondly, the executive director role should not be a full-time role at this time. So perhaps the administration should reduce its, reduce its payroll budget to transfer the 15,000 that the report identifies as a support to the current inspiring Innisfil fund. In addition, our CFO, Lockie Davis, currently has responsibility as a CFO slash treasurer to oversee the money held in reserve. In addition, sorry, he, if he has that role today, why does the organization, organization have to have him double dip? As mentioned, many established community foundations have a skill-based board, and the board itself would have a person with an accounting or financial background who could oversee the proposed accounting work that Lockheed is proposed to take on. So skill-based training on your board would alleviate that concern to the board. And Lockheed, I like what you're doing. I know you're retiring. Get the heck out while you can. Okay, so another thing that we've looked at, currently the in-power and in-services and potentially Innisfil Energy Services typically have two types of board members, elected and appointed officials from the town and independent members. You may want to, I may want to introduce, I'm going to ask council, a motion requesting that the stipends paid to elected and appointed town members be curtailed and the amount of annual stipends be donated and redirected to the town for the purpose of supporting the community foundation staffing and administrative cost. So what happens in the town, we have these other companies that the mayor sits on, CFO sits on, staff sit on, they're already being paid, but they get a stipend to sit on those three different boards again. If we put a motion forward to eliminate that stipend, or that stipend is moved aside, that cost is put aside to provide administration and staffing for this committee, therefore we wouldn't have to put out that $50,000. And that $50,000 is just half of the cost. So that position is getting $100,000. How many of our staff are making $100,000 a year? I know as counselors we're not. So my question is there are other avenues to look at and we'll deal with that later. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rayner and then Councillor Rossetti. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, since a couple of those questions were related to uh, town administration, why don't I start? And happy to pass it over uh, to the board members. Uh, the first clarification is that it's $50,000 for administration for the foundation, including FTE. So uh, without getting into all of the details, because we, I don't think the foundation has decided what the salary would be for an ED. Uh, that's to cover all of the overhead costs, the mailing, uh, and other types of overhead and administration. And as you're well aware, uh, there's actually a 30% uh, burden that we usually place on salary figures to address pension, sick time, uh, and all of those kinds of things that come with, with employees. So uh, e even if all of that went to salary, it actually uh, would, would not be a $100,000 position. I can guarantee you that. Uh, the second point, I think, just to clarify, is the, the, the foundation is proposing a half an FTE, a half of a person, which you, you can't really divide a person, but you know what I mean, half of the time of a person in order to allow them, as Reverend Courtney said, to rev up, to manage the expenses of the foundation in the early phases as minimally as possible because everyone wants to see maximum dollars going, in fact, to the community. So it's only a half an FTE as we get started. Certainly if the FTE, if the foundation gets up to, revs up to speed faster than the five-year timeline that we're uh, projecting, uh, the economy, I suggest, will have a lot to do 
do with that, um, they may be able to take on the full burden of the FTE uh, sooner than that, but uh, time will tell. Uh, I'll ask uh, Mr. Davis, uh, our CFO, to speak to the endowment, but I can just clarify for you that no monies have been received by the town in trust for a foundation, which I think is what you're alluding to, Deputy Mayor. Uh, the fundraising that goes on and has gone on with mayors, golf tournaments, and uh, galas are, are generally fundraised for the spirit of the community, and the spirit of the community was not put into trust funds or endowment funds. Uh, they were specifically set up to build a reserve fund uh, that would ultimately be moved over to a foundation. Uh, and whether or not to endow the funds to the foundation is very much a question that I think is alive in front of you today. Uh, the, the board is recommending to you based on uh, best practices in foundations today and the research that's been done that the greatest amount of flexibility that you can give the foundation, particularly at its outset, can ultimately have huge repercussions down the road. We're aware of a foundation, and I think Winnipeg, that has an endowment that is uh, in excess of $900 million, because you can never use the endowed funds uh, ever for uh, the very purpose that the foundation has been set up for. So that's why the advice you're, you're seeing today that frankly wasn't available in 2012 when I was here and we set up uh, this uh, concept of putting money aside uh, that, because we didn't do the research at that time. Um, in terms of the skilled board, I think I can comment on, on that briefly because uh, we were involved obviously in recommending to you the board that sits before you who I'm going to suggest, I think, uh, quite directly, are extremely skilled uh, members of the community uh, and are probably the best people we could find, uh, even if we spent an exhaustive many, many years looking for people, and I think many councillors would agree with me. Uh, and I think you're right, Deputy Mayor, that in fact you look for a, a diverse set of skills, and I think that's something that the board is looking at and conscious of as it grows, uh, but it wants to manage the, the costs and expenses of associated with uh, bigger boards and the, the agility that can come with smaller boards, especially as you're setting up the foundations. But before you, you have people that are skilled in not only delivery of programs, uh, familiarity with charities and nonprofits, the specific social issues that affect our community are directly reflected in the board, and you have uh, one of the greatest philanthropists that this community has ever seen uh, with the recent $2 million donation to the Rosardo, uh, the Rosardo Health and Wellness Center. I, I'm, I can't imagine a more skilled board, and I'm not trying to, I know they're here, so they're gonna kick me later for, for that, but, but I think that there is a skill set there, and I think one of the things that the, the foundation is trying to do with its list of policies that it wants to develop is to bring clarity and transparency to those exact items. You know, what is the what is the governance policy? Who, how do you get on the board? What is the nominating process? Um, and that's the really good work that these volunteers are going to do uh, over the next uh, uh, several months. And with respect to the stipends, uh, you know, unfortunately, the boards control the compensation for our companies. Uh, and you just recently had a board governance review proposal in front of you for all three boards, uh, and you approved the continued stipend uh, as a part of that process. So you'd be reconsidering your decision if you decided to change paths tonight. Uh, certainly, the boards are open to uh, opportunities. But one of the things you said in that board governance was that you were looking for, in fact, chairs specifically um, and, ch and switching the chair role so that you could have someone who's very skilled and who understands those industries in water, wastewater, uh, and in, uh, in power. And to do that, you, you, you need to compete. And uh, that market is quite lucrative, uh, as you can imagine. So uh, I wouldn't suggest going down that road at that time. Thank you, Worship. Thank you very much. And I had Councillor, who was after that? Councillor Sadi, and then I'll, I'll go to you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, sorry. Um, I don't think anybody's questioning the people in front of us on the board or their qualifications or the, the, the strengths that they would uh, bring to this uh, foundation. Um, I, I think uh, this is a big change. Uh, for the town and for the community and how the funds are going. And I think that in, as you quoted, clarity and transparency, I really think that um, I'd like to recommend that a deferral 
of voting on this item until the next council meeting because this is a big item and I think it would be important in the community to also get some feedback and it would it's just been presented. A lot of people haven't gone online. They may not have read it. They may like to come here in support of it or give comments at the next council meeting. And then we could, uh, uh, or even groups to uh, make comments then. And then we could vote at that time when everybody's had an opportunity to also weigh in on it and, and give support in their comments and feedback as well. So I'd like to recommend a deferral until the next council meeting of this item. I have a seconder, and that is Deputy Mayor Davidson. Thank you. Uh, so there's a motion on the floor to defer to the next council meeting. Questions or comments on the deferral? Uh, Deputy Mayor. I move forward to second that. I'd like to just get some clarification, follow up on my last comments, okay? So when I talked about stipends, I said it very directly here. Introducing a motion requesting that stipends paid to elected and appointed town members, in other words, staff, outside people who are being, we've asked to go outside to get skilled help to sit on these boards, they would receive their stipends. But people who are currently receiving on payroll and income from the town would re move the stipends from them and the mayor and the CEO, CEO whoever else, and move that over to cover the cost of the community foundation staffing and administrative cost. But let's go back to DSR 030-12. A community foundation is a registered charity, and at that time, if we go to page three, the creation of a community foundation that could ultimately be self-sufficient, annual amounts of $15,000 per annual will be put into the community foundation reserve. So there I have a question. Have we been putting $15,000 a year since 2012? Have we used all that money? And is, where is that money? Is it some of it still available? And then I go on to look a little bit further in the report and I see the word community foundation is a registered charity which seeks and pulls gifts and endowments to sustain itself. Income generated from gifts and endowments. So far we haven't, you, the CFO, CEO says we haven't received endowments. If that's the case, that's great. But an additional endowment and ongoing gifts must be sizable enough to sustain the fund for benefiting charities over the years. So the word endowment has been used in the report from uh, 2012. So it is there if we do receive from it. So again, my question is, we have to, that 50,000, you're gonna work your way slowly up to that 50,000, but in the report it says matching. So is the town gonna to have a 50,000 aside an operational cost plus this 50,000? There's my question. So I think in deferring it till we get more information and it goes to the public is a perfect idea at this time. Thank you. So are you asking a question? Sorry, Your Worship, I'm just putting my comments out there that I've heard what the CFO told the audience tonight. I understand it, but I think when you go back to the original report, endowments are a word that are used, and if endowments do come into the trust fund or into the situation, we have to look at not touching them. So we have to really watch our operational cost and make sure we're not taking away from the community to pay a payroll. So just to be clear, Deputy Mayor, you're quoting from a report from 2012, right? Yes, so I you've am. got a council here. That hasn't seen that it. That is, no, but this council is not held to a decision made by a council in 2012. I think we, if we go we're back. Here to, we're, we're here to set our own direction. We've, you know, over the years, we've done many things that are, um, you know, moved through the course. So and you're saying we should remove history that. from the knowledge, because if I go back to another uh, report, uh, from uh, February 20th, 2013, which is the proposed Innisfil Community Grants model, the model that it was all established at. So you kind of have to look at the history of what we got, where we're going, and how we're going to do it, how it started from the allocation and utilization policy with OLG, and we've also got the OLG slot revenue policy. I have that as well and modernization plans and suspension of grant programs. So there's a lot of history there we need to kind of look at 
and then put it all together before we make a decision which way we're going to go. So that's why I'm supporting Don Arasati and second a motion to defer it until all this information people have a chance to review. That's all I'm asking. Thank you. So um, yeah, I'm happy to uh, to defer. So uh, let, to let um, the community uh, have a comment here. Uh, I've been here for all that history. So and and the it has morphed over the years, uh, and we are you know making it fit uh, the times. In 2003, there wasn't an opioid crisis. In 2003, I would suggest that uh, Reverend Courtney didn't have the number of people at his food bank and his clothing depot that he has today. In 2003, there was more support for uh, people in our community who needed that support from other levels of government. So uh, I so appreciate that uh, the work that you've put into this. Please don't take a deferral as uh, anything other than the fact that um, in our procedural bylaw, uh, unlike most, we have uh, council and committee the same night. So uh, if we were in the city of Barrie, we would have this in committee the whole, and then two weeks later we'd confirm it in council. But in our, in our community, because we want to be agile and nimble, and, and when it's a small little housekeeping thing like removing a hold or something, you know, we can move it, pass it the same night. Uh, when we have issues that we think uh, are the, the community is going to be interested in and want to sink their teeth in uh, and and get excited about, we want to give the community time to to give that feedback to us. So I can imagine um, having more capable people uh, and and the people who actually not only um, who, who who are there either with uh, a hand up, you know, or a hand out. And, and all of you are those people. And so thank you for your time tonight. And um, I look forward to, uh, to hearing what the community has to say about this. I think it's gonna be uh, very exciting moving forward. And I, the last thing I wanna say is how fortunate we are to live in a part of, uh, uh, to live in a municipality where we have where we can have this discussion, where, where we can say that we can organize, whether it's a golf tournament or, or, a, um, or a gala, and have community members come out and support it and give of themselves and donate money to that. And also the, um, the, the proceeds from the OLG, you know, we get $5 million a year from the OLG. And uh, so a very, we're talking about a very small portion um, that we, we could direct to a group that can really make a difference in our community. So having said that, I will uh, ask for a vote on the deferral. Okay, your worship, <clears throat> sorry, your worship. Just wanted to clarify, we have the motion to defer up there. It's simply for time's sake, um, but if you wanted to ask staff to consider questions and report back, you'd have to add something further, but this, just to defer uh, for time's sake to September 11th as it is now. Right, so there's, there's is that, uh, the right now it's just to defer till September the 11th for time's sake? Sorry, Mayor, uh, just a couple conversations going out at the same time. My uh, recommendation to defer this to the next uh, council meeting was to give an opportunity to the public in case they wanted to make comments or uh, you know, do a presentation, whether they want to do a delegation to speak on this as well and ask their questions so that the, we all had an opportunity to understand it before council voted on it. This is a big item and I've learned um, being on term two that sometimes in hindsight you think, I wished I'd done that. So this is one that I'd like to give the public an opportunity. Thank and you for that, Councilor Arsati. And uh, that's, I think we all understood that. So anybody who's here or anybody who's watching who would like to come to open forum to talk about it on September the 11th, who'd like to call the clerk's office and make a delegation uh, on September the 11th, they're, they're more than welcome to do that. Councilor Isis. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I guess 
I'd like to echo what has been said about the uh, the, the exciting um, opportunity that this is for Innisfil to uh, to start this up from scratch, and, and I'm excited to hear about the benefits. Um, as we went through this discussion, though, uh, about these recommendations, uh, maybe for me being a new councillor and, and, and a uh, request to maybe uh, on, from the recommendation. Um, so my question would be to those uh, councillors here that had those concerns that we you brought forward. The recommendations that I read there, those those concerns don't fit in, like unless I'm missing something. Like, is there more information that that we need to see on on the report that staff has time to uh, to put into it? Uh, before the September 11th meeting. So I guess that's my question for, uh, for those uh, councillors who had concerns about this report. Uh, are we missing something before we vote on it next time? So I think, I think what the councillor's asking is, he's, did you... So, so um, just from the discussion about how this affects uh, some of the funding that is currently in place in Innisfil. I read the report. Uh, was there some information that, that you had from historically um, Deputy Davidson or, or that, that you felt we, we didn't have uh, to, to make a decision now, um, Councillor Sadi, that, that you'd like to see that would help the community and help help me as a new counselor um, understand this report? So I think, I think the best thing to do, counselor, would be to ask the questions. The, the reports that, uh, that the deputy mayor were um, looking at were um, years of reports before that had to do with the same, and, and they were made available through the through, um, uh, CAO's office. And I'm sure they'd be welcome to you too if you need any of that information. And um, and the answer about the community or the discretionary fund, the, the fifty thousand that was in the budget, I think, um, and just avail yourself to staff if you've if you've got questions or if you hear questions from the community that you think, oh, I never thought of that, and then avail yourself of staff to to have some of those questions asked over the next um, month almost. Uh, oh. Councillor Waters. Um, just a, a quick question is that um, uh, the agenda was put out and this item was in the agenda, people could read it. Um, is there, why are there no, no public here tonight if they wanted to support or disagree with this? So that my question is, is there something going on that we don't know about? Deputy Mayor Davidson? Sorry? I'm just, is there any, is there anything here we don't know about? Deputy no, Mayor? I actually want them to listen to the public a little bit more and make sure that we're clean and clear where we're going. And I think Donna Sadi and I had our concerns. I think Councillor Van Berkel had his concerns as well. My job as Deputy Mayor is to listen to Council as well. And if they have concerns, make sure they're brought forward, which I did. And I think we do need the more time to look at these past histories to see how the foundation was started what was its principles, what was its mandate, and are we diverting from the original mandate, which happens a lot in government. We forget our original mandate and we spread out all over the world before we know it's costing us money here, 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 and here. And I just wanna make sure we're not going in that direction. So I suggest to council, re get, re require these reports, read them, understand the mandate, and then at the next council meeting, we can make an informed decision. That's all. Councillor Sadi. From, uh, for myself, Councillor Waters um, and, and Councillor Ices, um, it's about the, the way the town of Innisfil runs our council meetings. The agenda is posted on a Friday, I believe. Is it, is it Friday? Wednesday. Wednesday for, for council. But this is a summer season. This is an important item. It may be very important to the community to support these causes. They may want to speak in support of this. And I feel that important items like this, 
we should give the public, our residents, more time. They don't have time to, to have even maybe seen it for many people. They may be hearing about it the first time tonight and not have an opportunity to speak about it. So if we vote on it, they may have had something, a question that may have raised another concern that we needed clarified. I, I just feel that it's an important item and our, our residents deserve the opportunity. There may be nobody who shows up and then it's not a concern. Uh, or there may be no concern, it just gives them an opportunity to give feedback or ask a question or be in support of it. Councillor Van Berkel and then we'll move on. Thank you, Orisha. It's the longest debate we've had over deferral ever. <laughs> I don't think the item is, is whether we understand it or not. I understand perfectly what you're trying to do. And uh, it's probably, if I, I read the report and I'm thinking about it, I thought about it, and it's probably a good way of doing it. But it's all these groups that have been coming to your board, to whatever board, all these years, asking for a grant. They don't understand, and I think with tonight's debate, it being televised and that, there will be more interest in it. People will, will hear what we've debated here tonight. Um, as Councillor Saudi said, this just went on the web on, on Friday or whatever, and uh, everybody, anybody I know, except maybe the people that are here, they don't read our agendas. They don't know what's going on. So it's not for my concern, but it's for the concern of our, our, our constituents, our residents, who have been going to your board, to your committee, and asking for grants. In their mind, maybe this is like the grants are over and done with, which they're not. But for them, it might be just that, and, and we need to clarify that. So I agree with deferring this to the next council meeting and, and seeing if there is more input from the public. And if there isn't any, well, then, you know, so be it. Then we'll pass it. But until then, I would like to defer it to. Then we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Those opposed? That's carried. Thank you very much for being here and, uh, and look forward to working with you in the future. Next we'll go to, where are we now? Uh, item seven, County Council, Municipal Associations. Uh, any updates anybody would like to bring forward? Uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Worship. Uh, County Council, we've had a huge discussion this week on waste and recycling pickup. We've had some severe, severe staff shortages from the waste collector our, that we use. It's hard to believe in this day of age, people don't want to work for $25 an hour, plus benefits, plus, plus, plus. But that is the problem they're facing. So the county has reached out to various other waste collectors to um, help and assist us, but unfortunately, we still can't meet the demand. I know that uh, Councillor Payne's ward this week did not have a recycling pickup, and as I drove here tonight, recycling was still sitting out on the streets. Hopefully it'll be picked up this Monday because we're trying to get the backlog, but the problem is we pick up the backlog, we can't pick up the current. So due to this decision, one of the decisions we made yesterday is that we've canceled the electronic collections for Simcoe County for this term uh, because we can't get the backlog done and we can't get the people to work. Uh, we don't know what the problem is outside, but it seems to be that we can't find people to fill the position, so I just want you to be aware that if your constituents call you about your recycling still sitting there, or raccoons getting into it, and if you go to the end of the 30th side road today, you'll see all that recycling garbage sitting next to the dock. I took pictures of it, I have it on my camera. So it is happening, so I want you to be aware of that. And also, too, we moved a very strong motion on seniors, uh, in assisting seniors to upgrade their houses, upgrade their apartments into, uh, there's a fund set aside of $500,000 for seniors now in Simcoe County to make living at home a little easier for them. Thank you. Thank you, and I would just add that there's a wonderful app that's free that you can download. It's called Simcoe County Collects. 
and it's wonderful because it's, in Innisfil, there's many different collection days depending on where you live, and the app gives you specific direction as to, you know, okay, leave it out till eight o'clock or bring it in tonight or uh, whatever it is, the direction that they're giving you, and it's, and it's, and it's site-specific for your address, so you're, you're getting the right information. Yes, thank you very much, Councillor. Anyone else who has a, an update? Seeing none, uh, we'll go to the consent list. And uh, I was very remiss in not saying at the very beginning of the meeting that Councillor Nichols sent his regrets uh, that he couldn't be here tonight, so I apologize for that. So the consent list, for those of you who are not regulars, um, we go through the list. Uh, anything in the agenda that is not pulled, then at the end of that agenda, we will pass a motion approving the written recommendation that's with that piece. So if it doesn't get pulled, whatever's in the report is the approved agenda or the approved recommendation for that item. So I'll start with the minutes of the special council meeting on uh, June 26th. The regular council meeting minutes of June the 26th. The Innisfil Beach Park Ad Hoc Committee Report, B1. Standard requests is the uh, is the request from Innisfil Events Community Events Corporation. Next is item D one, which was already withdrawn. That was an item around center the Centerville development in Stroud. I hope there's nobody here who was waiting for that and sat through all this only to find out it was withdrawn. I should have said that at the beginning of the meeting. I apologize. Item D two, the Community Foundation Fund, we've already dealt with. Item D3, street naming for the Innes Village draft approved plan of subdivision. Item D4, 34, uh, the draft approved plan uh, name for that item. Item D5, the bicycle lane and multi-use trail parking bylaw amendment, Councillor Sadi. Refer. Referred by Councillor Sadi. Item D6, the traffic calming strategic update. Councillor Sadi. Refer. Thank you. Item D7, the staff report regarding the sixth line and the 400 update. Excuse me. Item E1, the uh, part of Maple Grove, the uh, surplus lands. Item F, correspondence for action, uh, correspondence from Mr. Harmon regarding the, um, the, the fire invoice. Seeing none. The correspondence list in G. Uh, item G1 is the second quarter financial overview. Really comprehensive, that was a great read, thank you. Item G2, project manager regarding Lockhart Road reconstruction. Woohoo! <laughs> so that's for all the people uh, from Lockhart. We've uh, we've awarded the RFP for that project. So looking forward to it'll be it'll be a lot of construction, but worth it. Item G3, the uh, strategic leader for uh, the South Innisfil Creek drain. Again, uh, an 18 to 20 year project almost nearing completion. So I'm very excited about that. There's two proclamations, Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder Day and National Coaches Week. Intergovern intergovernmental uh, correspondence from the County of Simbol Simcoe G6. Board and agency correspondence. There's one from the Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit regarding the minutes of the meeting and G8 in services memo uh, regarding conservation, uh, water conservation communication. G9, a letter from Mrs. Martin. So I don't often do this, but I'm gonna refer that. G10, a thank you letter from St. Peter's Catholic School for uh, support with their 
graduation ceremony, and the other G11 from Nantar Shores for the same thing. Okay. F1, sorry, H1, the Innisfil Heritage Advisory Committee Special Report. That's not pulled. Supplementary items. Oh, sorry, the consent list now. So I need a recommendation to pull those items off the consent list. Deputy Mayor Davidson, Councillor Van Berkel, all those in favor? That's carried. And motion to resolve into Committee of the Whole. Councillor Ices, Councillor Fowler, all those in favor? That's carried. So if any of the items that we didn't pull, those, the recommendations are as in the agenda, as printed. So the first one is item D5, and that was uh, Councillor Arsati. Thank you, I apologize. I had my microphone, so may have background noise on the um, video stream. Uh, I just want to pull this item uh, because the in relation to the uh, multi-use uh, bicycle lanes that are going to be installed as a pilot. I'm on sorry to interrupt. Councillor, would you have a mover in a second? Are you moving I and do. you've got a seconder? Thank you. Seconder, Councillor Fowler's Fowler. a seconder. Okay. Um, sorry. Uh, the uh, multi-use uh, lanes that will be installed on Chan's Boulevard, uh, Webster, uh, there is um, options here for, uh, in regards to this, uh, a question that I, I had for uh, Ms. Jenkins uh, was uh, with the bike lanes being uh, installed, multi-use lanes being installed on both sides of the road, um, whether there was a, a lane for parking, and she clarified that there was, but uh, then in the recommendation, there is that we would, um, with the multi-use lanes, there would be no parking. So I'm just feeling that there's going to be some confusion in the community that if we have a town-wide policy that you can't park in the multi-use lanes, then, and you, you can on one side of the road, then it's confusing that I can here and I can't there. I asked Ms. Jenkins for a diagram to help me to understand that. I don't know if um, our clerk services have that to show for um, council, just for a clarification. Thank you. So, Ms. Ms. Jenkins, if you could just help me out with this, because this is certainly going to impact the the you know, the traffic concerns and uh, that residents have, especially on Webster and Jans, where it's a wide road. So I understand that the theory is that it is a traffic calming measure, uh, the multi-use uh, trails. So if we look on the, uh, the right-hand side lane, we have a bike lane indicated. And then on the left, so these bike lanes, so the parking will still be on the inside lane. The multi-use will now be on the outside, clearly defined, and that's how your recommendation is. So I just want to clarify, because we didn't have this visual before in the document. Ms. Jenkins. Through your worship, uh, yes. So this is not exactly what our design is, but it's very similar. It's a similar example of the configuration that we're looking at. So as you can see, the bike lanes are well-defined uh, through both the uh, linear uh, line painting and the symbols. And um, it should be very clear from the lane widths as well what the designated parking areas are. So we've made sure um, on Webster, Jans, and Leslie that we've maintained some parking on one side of the road. Um, so we feel that without the signage, it should still be clear uh, where the parking is allowed and where it's not. And um, with option two, with putting signs on both sides of the road saying no parking in the bicycle lane, we actually feel that that might provide more uh, confusion to the public if there were signs out there saying no parking because they might not see that in the bike lane part, port, part of it. So um, it is our recommendation that we don't sign these and we think that the pavement markings will be sufficient to uh, provide um, the parking areas and make it clear to the public. Thank you, Councillor Sadi. Follow up. 
So um, if we're not doing that, and it says in the report that they uh, that you will be um, uh, so you will be including a statement six section nine to prevent uh, vehicle uh, parking within the bicycle lanes, multi-use trails, and direct staff to send an application to the regional senior justice for approval of a new fine parking stopping in a bike lane multi-use trail. How will the residents know in the town of Innisfil that this is going to come in place? Um, because on some of the other streets, um, they have been parking on it. So how will, how will we notify the residents so that they don't get a ticket and then say, we weren't notified of this change? I, I would hope that people would hope they would get a ticket if they're parking in a bike lane. But anyway, I'll let Ms. Jenkins answer that. Uh, through your worship, yes. So um, we are planning as part of this pilot project as well to do some um, edu public education and a communications plan to get the information out to the public to, to help them understand how these bike lanes work and what will and will not be enforced. So um, yes, part of our project is to also do the communication strategy to the public to make sure that they understand how they work. Go ahead, Councillor. Thank you for the leniency. One final comment is that I know that the uh, if we take a look at the example of the bike lanes that are on Innisfil Beach Road um, for uh, vehicle traffic, you're not even aware there's a bike lane because they just look like part of a pavement with a white line and you have to really look for the little bicycle marks. Um, I know I had uh, asked um, whether these could be painted different, such as on St. John's Road. I know that there's um, a cost to that, but I think moving forward, if we could look at grants or you know, any, any funding that we could get to help, because that would clearly define what's a bicycle lane, what's a road shoulder, because it's not clear on, on some of the roads, just as a, a, a comment. Mr. Enwood, how are we doing with our line painting contract? Uh, Your Worship, we're uh, plugging away. Uh, we're experiencing some challenges and uh, I'm anticipating coming back to Council uh, probably in the winter months with a new proposal for a new service level for 2020. Deputy Mayor Davidson. Thank you, Worship. I have to make a comment about line painting. If you take the two mile turn on Big Bay Point with what's going on at Friday Harbor, there's no lines and they don't know where the sides of the road are, trust me. Anyhow, go back to this drawing here. So what you're proposing for these streets is what we see in front of us. So the picture to the left of my left, where you show the bike, there's parking and there's a bike lane, that's what you're proposing. Through your worship, uh, yes, this is the configuration that we are planning for uh, Jans Boulevard, Webster, and Leslie. Okay, great, because in the Danforth, which is a very busy avenue in Toronto where I spend a lot of time, um, this is exactly what they have, and you just educate people when you open your car door, you look, you know how to do it now when you're getting out of your car. So it's a great way to allow parking because a lot of those driveways in those particular areas are so short they can let barely park a pickup truck in their own laneway so they need additional parking especially with the uh, kids moving back home today so there's my other thing and i'm glad we're going this way i'd rather go the street painting because the other way it totally were 491 signs on five streets if that isn't sign pollution Nothing is. That's just crazy. On 8th Street, sorry, and that was a cost of $100,000. So I'm pretty well guessing a painting would be a lot less. Is that correct? Okay, good. I'm happy with that. Thank you. Other questions? Councillor Waters? Thank you, uh, Worship. Uh, just more of a comment is that I am a cyclist, and I do appreciate the bike lanes, and I look forward to seeing these. I would encourage... Uh, something on the 25th and the 20th uh, because they're deadly roads to cycle on. So uh, I appreciate this and I look forward to it growing throughout Innisfil. Thank you. And, and every time we do uh, redo a road, uh, we are making them wider for cycling like we did um, uh, Maple and Bel Air. Um, is Bel Air? No, and Bel Air all have them now. So, you know, but it's, it's going to take time. 
to get everywhere. Uh, Councillor Fowler? More of a question in regards to this. Uh, we're getting two extremes here. We're getting either sign, signs or the basic paint, which no one really seems to understand where it belongs. Can we not find a medium in between, like for example, some highly fluorescent paint, uh, reflective, something that will be considerably less than $98,000, but will still increase the visualization capabilities of this project? So I, I think Mr. Inwood told us that he's gonna come back with, with a new um, paint contract. Um, we have had an issue with line painting. Uh, I see Ms. Jenkins indicating. Through your worship. Um, yeah, so as part of, of this project, um, we did look at doing the sort of what's sort of the North American standard of green paint, uh, which we piloted on St. John's. However, the costs associated with that paint and then completing the maintenance work on that in future years is um, significantly higher than just using the standard white paint. And so when we looked at the, the budget that we had for the project, we couldn't stay within budget and still do the green paint. Uh, we did you know, have multiple discussions with our planning and operations team about it. And um, in the end, we determined that um, to move forward and do these, these new bike lanes as um, a pilot and do the education piece, uh, that at this time we wouldn't do the green paint. However, that's not to say it couldn't be included in future budget cycles. Thank you, Councillor Fowler, follow up. Uh, just so I understand, I'm not trying to be difficult here. Um, you're saying that to increase from white paint to green paint would cost the equivalent of $98,000 for the project? Through your, through your worship, um, our original estimates with adding um, some more significant hatching uh, for delineation and some green paint uh, was in the $250,000 range. And uh, with modifications to the design, we've been able to keep it you know, under $100,000 for the contract. So significant savings. Mr. Inwood. Uh, through your worship, if I can add, when, when we paint uh, the solid green lines, uh, there's a significant amount of work and a significant uh, amount more product than a, a standard line like you're seeing in the drawings uh, provided here today. So that helps you understand the, the difference in costs. Uh, and I do want to highlight that uh, we are working with uh, the industry and in, in looking at some new paint products um, that are coming down the pipe. So again, I'll be back to Council in the winter with some updates. Deputy Mayor Davidson. Thank you, Your Worship. To Don, Councillor Asadi, um, if you maybe, or staff contact the county, the county has a bicycling program, a biking program for, for Simcoe County, and I know they have a budget there. There may be a budget to uh, approach and look at it to see about funding to assist maybe this project. But also, a new thing, I have a new car, and if I get close to a white line or any line on the, on the road, it tells me right away what kind of, on my, whatever this thing is in my car, it just tells me right away that there's a white line there, what the white line is for. So as we move forward with new technology and all our cars are having these gadgets, what I would call an iPad in my car, drives me nuts. But it even shows up on my speedometer in front of me telling me what these white lines are for. And I know most people who commute in Innisfil have a new car. So uh, that technology is moving forward very fast. I don't think we need to spend more money on cutter lines when technology is advancing. When you say there's new paint, there's new ideas, I think we just wait, we might find it. Thank you, and we were successful in that cycling grant for a path on, uh, on the newly constructed trail uh, on County Road 21. Councillor Van Berkel. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I, for one, was happy to see this uh, parking bylaw because the bike lanes on uh, St. John's and on Maple Road and Valley Beach Road, they're dangerous. They're absolutely dangerous. People park on that, those lanes, bicycles, and, and, and people come walking by. And I seen my, my own eyes the other day where bikes come and it parked. The guy just parked there and he's coming and he opened the door. Another car coming alongside of it, and he missed it by that much. The guy fell off his bike onto the car, and it was a big argument. But something needs to be done, so I, I like, I'd like to see like a $500 fine for parking here, myself. Thank you, any other comments? 
Seeing none, the recommendation has been moved and seconded duly, and we'll call the question. All in favor? And any contrary? That's carried. Next item is, sorry, what have I done? Your Worship, nothing. Sorry, I, I just got an email from staff that uh, there's a car in the parking lot with its lights on, a gray Jetta BBSB677. Did everybody hear? Oh. <laughs> Okay, so we'll uh, carry on with item D6. Uh, Councillor Sadi. Yes, I need a seconder for this one. Um, thank you. I have uh, Councillor Ices. So um, on this item, um, the traffic calming strategy update, uh, this uh, um, item, and as it mentions in the report, uh, went to the uh, Traffic Safety Committee, which I'm a member of. I was, they did not reach quorum. I was one of the ones absent because I was in Europe at a funeral. Um, my concern is that um, the committee that addresses the traffic that would like to make recommendations, did not have an opportunity to give that uh, feedback. And the next meeting of the Traffic Safety Committee is on August 29th. I would like to recommend, be, uh, because there's questions in here about using the gas tax funding cannot be used for municipal staff time, but it can be used for consulting fees and contractor labor. Um, questions about that, and, this, and the committee may have specific Made in Innisfil solutions that they would like to address for some of this funding. So what I'd like to recommend is that this report be deferred until the September meeting to allow um, this report to go to the Traffic Safety Committee um, to debate it and come up with agreements and suggestions. Uh, and I see Councillor Van Berkel nodding, who sits on the committee. And um, that is my uh, request for this item, is to defer it to the September meeting to allow this to go to the traffic safety, who has been working diligently to get some traffic measures in and funding. Thank you, Councillor. I know that uh, that Ms. Catillo was here tonight uh, prepared to give us the presentation should we want it. Uh, we still have at least a few items to get through tonight. So, uh, but I'll ask Council how they feel if, they're, if they want to receive the presentation this evening or if they're happy with deferring it to September the 11th. Mr. Rayner. Your Worship, members of council, I just wanted to clarify that uh, part of the concept is to uh, to allocate 500,000 of the million, uh, which to an existing project that you have already approved. And and you know what happens with procurement timelines. Uh, you know another month delay. You know likely means that there will be no implementation this fall whatsoever, which is okay. Um, but I just wanted to clarify that it's not the full million that's in play here. Uh, so that if the Traffic Safety Committee did decide on specific implementations, for example, on August 29th, there's still funding available to be able to do those specific implementations. Um, the other point I would just be, just seek your clarity on is if on August 29th you do not have quorum at the TSEC, what do you want us to do? Do you want us to come back again? Do we just wait until we get quorum at TSEC? Just some clarity if, if that's the objective uh, from Council it would be helpful. Thank you. I'll speak to that. So um, it's the first time we've ever, Mr. Rayner, had uh, struggled with quorum in that committee. So it's it, they're normally very, very um, conscientious, but it was July the 4th, uh, and we were supposed to have the meeting in June, and it didn't occur. Uh, also, um, I've had some discussions. I actually went to one of the traffic safety committees in Bradford and was looking at them, I know they've got some ideas on maybe uh, partnering on on some um, ideas too. So um, so I think, I know it's another month, but it's, it's 
chances are we're not going to get any um, material on the ground until the spring now anyway, at this point. Uh, so I think that if we have work on this study over the winter, decide where we're going and, and then, you know, be ready to pounce on all the speeders in the spring. <laughs> I'm, I'm good with that. I also want to look at, um, I was reading the other day about a, like a, a, a neighborhood charter where like the petition tonight that we received, we received a petition from people who want the roads paved. Well, we all know that the day that those roads are finished, the very next day, we'll all be hearing about how fast the cars are going on those roads. And in neighborhoods, such as the ones up in Big Bay Point where we saw, that we saw the, um, the petition tonight, the only people on those roads are people who either live there or they're visiting people who live there. So if we could get people to sign a petition saying, I will drive safely in my own neighborhood and I will ask my guests that are coming to see me to drive safely in my neighborhood and I will ask my children to drive safely in my neighborhood, maybe we can get some ground movement going in that direction too. I mean, I'm not saying that solves all the problems. There's commuter roads, there's arterial roads and, that, and collector roads that see volumes of traffic but I'm talking about the roads where, where people actually live and, um, and they need to have more respect for, the, um, for their own communities. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Your Worship. In concurrence with the Mayor and the Charter, many years ago when Big Bay Point was paved, the main road on our side, Lakeshore and Lake View, we, in the summertime, from May till about October, the speeding and racing was unbelievable. So actually at that time, the IDA had a newsletter, and we, I wasn't even on council in those days. I asked the IDA to post it in their newsletter to tell their guests to slow down and their contractors to slow down. And they actually posted it, and it did help for a while. So you know what? Something like that might be good for Webster and those streets where everybody's speeding demons. Thank you, and I'm breaking my own rules. I'm sorry, it was a motion to defer, and, um, and I, I it's the comments that right now should only be on the motion, and I apologize for that, I got carried away. So it's, it should be defer, right? It's a motion to defer. So, and is there any other comments on the motion itself? Seeing none, all those in favor of deferring this motion? That's carried. To, can we just put on there to, to September 11th, or is that too late? Okay, thank you. All right, and then item G. So I had to pull this because I just thought it was the sweetest letter. So if you could just give me um, a moment to read this letter, and it's written to uh, Innisfil Fire and Rescue Service. Dear sir, this past Sunday is a day that I will remember with great pleasure and surprise. While working in my cottage garden, a huge fire engine drove past, turned around at the end of our road, and then began to come back the same way, but came to an abrupt and, abrupt and sudden stop. Uh, I, was, I had stopped lifting a large board that I was moving, um, as an explanation, I just sold a previous boat and I'd had the, the boards on the ground covering the grass. Uh, suddenly, four strong firemen uh, pulled, uh, jumped out of the truck and, um, I'm having trouble reading this, sorry, proceeded to lift all of the boards and stack them where I'd asked them to. When they asked about uh, my little cottage, which I mentioned I was not winterized, they brought up whether I'd had smoke alarms and smoke detectors, um, and I had not. Uh, with, the, with my promise to buy both the next day, they promptly installed some for, I was, for a loan for, for a week. I was so impressed with their genuine concern for, and helping me with my um, and an interest in my little cottage. They used the opportunity to educate me about having smoke detectors and, always, and alarms even in a cottage that is open for only part of the year. I'm so very grateful to all four and will always remember their professionalism. I had the opportunity to become aware 
of the fortune we are, it's a fortunate place we are in, in this cottage area to have such fine protection available in case of a fire. My sincere thanks and deep gratitude to all four men from station two, D platoon, who stopped to help me. Yours truly, Mrs. Martin. So would you please pass that on to um, D platoon and just let them know how nice it is especially when we get all the bad news. It's so nice to get an, a nice letter every once in a while. Please pass on our thanks. Mayor Dolan, I will pass that on. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I guess I need new glasses because I could hardly read that. All right, next item. Oh, mover and a seconder to receive that. Councillor Van Burkle, Councillor Waters. All in favor? That's carried. The rise recommendation? Moved by Councillor Ices, Councillor Sadi. All those in favor? That's carried. And the recommendation um, to consider the items and adopt the resolutions of Council, Councillor Payne, Councillor Van Burkle. All those in favor? That is carried. Announcement. Is there any announcements from members of Council? Councillor Fowler. Um, <clears throat> just so you're aware, uh, we have a new uh, superstar from Innisfil. Uh, we have a, an eight-year-old girl named Ava Silva. She was invited down to uh, Bayer Stadium, uh, home of the Rockford Peaches in Rockford, Illinois, for a baseball for all tournament. Now, just to give you an idea of, of how special this is, out of 350 people, I have 350 girls across North America, only two of them were from Canada, and she was one. Uh, she pitched, and they ended up winning the tournament. She is an amazing girl, uh, very focused, very bright star in her future. And I reached out to town staff and our worship, Mayor Dolan, to see about getting her an invite to council just to show our appreciation for the way she stepped up and shows everybody how it should be done. Thank you for that, Councillor Fowler. Councillor Asadi. Thank you. Uh, just an uh, announcement uh, in regards to uh, Lakeside Retirement, who will be holding their fall fair in, on Saturday, September the 7th, from 10 until 2 o'clock. And they invite everyone to attend. They, uh, seniors love seeing people come there. They'll have uh, lots of crafts and baking. And they've moved this fair away from, typically they hold it at Christmas. There's too many events at Christmas. So um, they'd really appreciate support of council. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Councilor Van Berkel. Yeah, just uh, I want to let everybody know that we have a second superstar, and that's Councilor Fowler. He won the pie eating contest <laughs> at the farmer's market. And I thought he would have brought his trophy, but he didn't. Somehow it doesn't surprise me. <laughs> Nobody was surprised. Thank you very much, Councillor Van Berkel. Any other announcements? I just wanted to, uh, to say that uh, many of us will be uh, heading to Ottawa. Uh, this weekend for the an annual conference of the Association of Municipalities of Ontario. There's 444 municipalities in Ontario and once a year uh, almost all of us uh, get together and there'll be about uh, 2,000 delegates. We have all, every single minister will be there, every single provincial minister will be there, all, all leaders uh, of each party will be there and uh, we have four four ministers' meetings, one starting Sunday with Minister Mulroney, and then also infrastructure and transportation. And um, I think that's all. I think we had one with the Solicitor General, but now we're doing it uh, in Toronto. So it's a, it's a busy time. Um, I'm looking forward to not being as busy this year. I'm past president of that organization. So last year was just, uh, last two years um, as the president, it was a bit of a blur. So. I'm looking forward to kind of having some time to actually learn this year. So uh, looking forward to that. And we'll be reporting back on all of the things that we learned at the conference when we, when we come back. And seeing no other announcements, I'd ask staff, is there any announcements uh, for the community? Seeing none. Is that adjournment? Uh, confirming bylaw first, I'm sorry. Who's, uh, who'd like to move that? Councillor Fowler and, and Deputy Mayor Davidson, all those in favor? An adjournment.
would be, Councillor Nichols not here, he always does adjournment. <laughs> Councillor Fowler and Deputy Mayor Davidson, uh, all those in favor? That's carried, thanks everyone. Uh, don't rush off, we have one more item in closed session that we have to do, uh, but we'll give everybody just five minutes uh, before heading uh, in there. So thank you all, thank you staff, thank you residents who uh, came out. Please come out more often, we love having you. Thanks those online too. <laughs>